Mary Murphy is a 75-year young mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, and the matriarch of the Rollins-Williams family. Mary's education and training background consists of floor arranging, nail technician, home decor, and 26 years in the healthcare industry as an assistant, hospice home health aide, and grief specialist. Mary spent several years serving in the community churches as president of the Missionary Society and Deaconess Board. Other servant roles include director of kitchen operations and event coordination. Mary loves to sing and dance. Her musical background started at the early age of nine years old. At age 17, she became a member of the Tiny York Band and a background vocalist for the Queen of Gospel, Albertina Walker. She continues her love for music as a lead vocal in local gospel groups and choirs. In her older adult years, she became the activity event director for her senior community at Green Pastor Commons organizing senior engagement, which focus on residents living their best lives and sharing memories of the good old times. Recently, Mary has committed her life to volunteer as a gun violence prevention advocate for the Moms Demand Action DeKalb local chapter in Georgia, after tragically losing her grandson to both city gun violence and gun suicide. Let's welcome her. Welcome, and thank you for tuning in to the Miami Night Show. Today, we are talking about uniqueness and I have a very special guest here, you guys. Um, we're gonna talk about what do uniqueness mean to you and what is that? what has that been through um, the process of grief for you. And I have here with me none other than my mom, Mary Murphy. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming and thank you for giving us some enlightenment about grief and being a part of the grief world and some of the experiences that you have had um, when you hear the word uniqueness, what does that mean to you? It means that you have something different than maybe others. Mm -hmm. And I was told at one time that I was unique. And how old were you around that time? I, were, I was 11 years old. It was the day I was baptized. Mm -hmm. And that day, uh, my pastor at that time back, in, back home, he said that when... He baptized me and when I came up, mm -hmm. he said there was something different about me and there was an aura over me. Wow. And he said that you are going to be something one day. He said, the Lord is going to lead you into mighty great things. Wow. I didn't understand what he was talking about. And he was just, he just kept saying, mm -hmm. they all called me sister. He said, sister, you're going to be, you are unique. Wow. So you are going to be something else. I know you've been a part of the grief world for some time. Can you tell me about an experience that first happened to you being a part of the grief world? Well, I was working at a funeral home and I was sitting at this desk. Mm -hmm. How old were you when you started I at the funeral home? 30, 31. Okay. I think 31. Wow. And I was sitting at the desk and they just a couple of doors behind me that would not stay locked when I was in the room. Mm -hmm. They would put a latch, it was a latch on the door, but they would lock it and they would leave out of the room and immediately after the person would leave out the room after they locked the door behind them, mm -hmm. the door would come unlatched. You and weren't it, afraid to be working in a funeral? <laughs> no, no, I, I felt at home, I felt no harm being done, what could happen to you? Everybody was dead. Right. So, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> right. But I know some people have fear, mm -hmm. but I, I didn't have that type of fear that they had. Mm -hmm. So what kind of, what, what was your duties there? I was secretary. Okay. Um, they were calling deaf calls and uh, the director, I would get in touch with them if they were not there to let them know uh, that we had someone that had expired and give them the address to go pick up the body. 
So besides this latch door that would never stay locked, were, did you have any other um, encounters with spirit working in the funeral home or was that just the only thing that occurred? That was the only thing besides uh, we decided to experience it. Want to make an experiment of it one day when some of the workers came in, they say, oh, something got to be going on here because it won't stay locked when you're here, but when we're here, it stay locked. So they decided to experiment. They sent me out of the room. Mm -hmm. The door stayed locked. Uh -oh. uh -huh. So they called me back in. They said, are you kidding? Sit back down. Uh -huh. I sat back down at the desk and they would go outside. And they would... Then they'll peep around the corner. Uh -huh. The latch is off again. They said, something going on here. I don't know what it is and I don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> but you were always having encounters with spirit. Um, which is, I think, like you said, your pastor told you that there was something special about you. And, yes. Um, we're going to just step right on in now to and talk about the stages of grief. And there are five to seven, but um, according to Dr. Kessler, and I just, I just want to make sure I have my notes here correct. Um, a lot of times when people don't understand what they're going through as in reference to um, dealing with death or learning how to process it. There are stages that you go through and I've learned that they're not for my own self going through um, the five stages of grief. Uh, they're not chronological. They happen at any given point. Um, but according to Elizabeth Kessler Ross and David Kessler, they kind of give us an example of some of the stages that you can go through and denial really is the first one and it's the first of the five stages of grief and it helps us actually survive the loss even though we're stuck there not you know of course you're not able to accept it initially because you're just you know in so much dis disbelief but let's go into uh, talking about denial for you do you know can you tell me about an incident with a, a family member or a loved one or um and where you were when you were in that state of denial. Yes, there well. Uh, it was my brother. Mm -hmm. He was older than me, the baby boy of the, uh, the nine of us. Mm -hmm. And he died by what, accident. What, what happened? And he was on the bridge fishing one afternoon, he and his wife and grandson and mother-in-law. Mm -hmm. And he had broke uh, a line on his pole, and he was going back to the trunk of his car to get to reline the pole. Mm -hmm. And someone was outrunning, trying to outrun the police, and the, his car went out of control. Mm -hmm. Hit my brother, knocked him unconscious, and his body landed in the body of the water. Oh my! And that's how my brother died. So I'm initially, lying. that's a tra traumatic death. So yes. of course you were in denial and shock. In denial, shock. And because at this time you were going through um, the uniqueness of your clairvoyance, and you were not knowing exactly what that meant, did spirit come to you at the at, at that time at, yes, during his did. death? The night before. Oh, okay. The night before his death, I. Before going, after going to bed, excuse me, mm -hmm. and just before going to sleep, I would have this. I couldn't breathe. Mm -hmm. I, I felt like I was losing. You know, I couldn't. I kept gasping for air okay. every time I would doze off to go to sleep. I, that's the way I was sounding. I would wake myself up. You know, making those sounds, mm -hmm. and I didn't know what was going on. So I would wake up and I would sit up in the bed and I would say, "Lord, what's going on?" Mm -hmm. So I thought myself was sick, mm -hmm. or I was about to have a heart attack, mm -hmm. and I would concentrate for a while just sitting there, then I would lay back down after I felt comfortable, mm -hmm. and then it would start all over again, that same, mm -hmm. and I said, well, what is going on? I would get up and walk around in the house, I checked on my daughter, Miami, she was a That's young me, kid yeah. at the time, to make sure her windows was closed and locked in her bedroom, and just walked over the house to be sure that nobody was breaking in or anything like that because I couldn't understand what was happening to me. Mm -hmm. And I did that several times, that same. Mm -hmm. And I guess for about the third time, I relaxed and went on to sleep. Okay, and then the, the next, next day. day. Mm -hmm. The next day. Wow. 
because it was, I guess, around approximately around four or five o'clock in the evening. Because mm -hmm. I went on to work that morning. Mm -hmm. And that next day, that's when I got the call that my brother had gotten killed, but he drowned. Wow. So I think that we can go into really saying that, you know, that part of you was kind of developing yes, itself. Exactly. Um, uh, this special thing that Pastor said that you had and um, still you didn't know what it was. I didn't know, but, I didn't know what was going on. That, that, has been a, that was a part of it yes. right there. So the next stage of grief is anger. Um, let's talk about a, a person in your life that were a stage where you were angry and um, who that person was. Well, I was angry with my ex-husband. Oh, my daughter Brenda. I'm so yeah, I'm, right now. I'm just I got all these memories coming back, and I know I got a lot of uh, issues with each one's death. But I was angry because my oldest daughter Brenda Lee, she had died, and she died because she had an aneurysm. And she went to sleep that Friday night and didn't wake up that Saturday. Mm -hmm. And the blood on her brain had shifted her brain because it was so much blood. And then I felt that because she had taken uh, a BC and went to sleep, that that may have caused those blood vessels to burst. Mm -hmm. I know that I'm allergic to incense mm -hmm. and I was Mm. had in my mind that that's what happened to my daughter mm -hmm. that this was had happened and I was angry about that because she had was taking those BC's and I was just trying to get myself to feel better by being angry mm -hmm. and blaming because, somebody yeah, else blame, blaming putting the blame on else. something else right. yes, exactly. that's a, and that's definitely a part of it we um, even though um, the death may seem, seem endless initially um, I think it's that despite that you're not even thinking about healing you just become angry and emotional exactly. and it's hard to manage and you want to place the blame on somebody and where is God and why did you do this and you know you're in pain yourself and you feel abandoned and you know all the things that are associated with grief and I think that was you know our normal feeling uh, with you being upset about it and now trying to blame somebody else for something else yeah, not someone exactly. else but something else That's for, exactly for what, happened. what happened and my sister of course she had um been in a coma for oh, over year for and a, a year and a half before she yes. passed and she ended up passing the day after Christmas on December 26 and initially when we first got the news of course it was disheartening but she had been in a coma yeah, for, a coma for so long, for so so long. I, it was mm -hmm. you know it was at some point an acceptance Exactly. We had accepted that that's what it was, but still the fact is, you know, she lost her daughter. So, right. you know, just trying to deal with that and trying to process not talking to somebody for a year, but they're still here was kind of difficult for our family. And I'm sure for her daughter, um, I know that at the time when prior to her transitioning, we were trying to move her from the facility that she was in. In Maryland and trying to move her here to to Georgia and, and I'm, my mom's hopes were so high because everything had been put in place it was yes. like within a couple of weeks that she was supposed to be here and um, with that not being able to happen and she just ended up transitioning it was it was difficult for my mom but um, how did you finally accept her death the day after she passed she passed the day after Christmas mm -hmm. and that Sunday was Christmas on a Saturday that year and that Sunday the Lord blessed me to see her it was it was such a I don't know how to explain this because I was sitting down mm -hmm. and it was a chair over against my wall and it looked like smoke was coming from the chair and I thought the apartment that was underneath me was on fire mm -hmm. because behind the chair was vents and I thought the smoke was coming from that okay. and I kept looking and I said oh my goodness I see smoke mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden the smoke just went straight to the bathroom wall mm -hmm. door mm -hmm. and I'm standing there in a maze where this door to my bathroom I hadn't thought of it yet but this door had a cross symbol on mm -hmm. it right. and next I saw my daughter standing there and she was smiling 
she was in this in the circle of this smoke mm -hmm. and the smoke was looking like looked like a cloud of smoke and the, it was just swaying from side to side brenda was standing in the center of the smoke with her hair long laying down on, across both her shoulders and she was just smiling and that was so peaceful to me mm -hmm. it was i'd had no fear I just looked at her and she smiled back at me. Then all of a sudden, my daughter and the smoke disappeared. Wow. So spirit comes to you a oh lot. Oh my God. It sounds like, it sounds like spirit does come to you a lot to let you know that everybody's and okay. She was at peace. She was at peace. And, she was and at peace. Well, we praise God for that. And we're, we're so thankful that you have that intuitive spirit to recognize that um, spirit can come to you and you know past life does exist and yes. they are able to come and guide and tell us that they're okay um, we're at the point of bargaining um, which is the third stage of grief and that's the guilty and what if I could have did this and what if I, I remember along my journey with Taiki um, and I don't know if I've, I haven't yet talked about um, here on the show that yes, I lost my son. Um, he suicided January 29th of 2017, but prior to his death, he had been shot and lost his best friend. And you know, there was this whole trial and you know, he had to deal with so many different things, you know, fear of, of um, because the individuals that shot him, he, they both knew them and you know, he dealt with a lot of fear and re Regret and um, survivor's remorse. He had PTSD. Um, he still had some physical ailments, which was a limp on his left side. He had some issues with his um, left arm. Um, just, you know, he went through a lot of physical things. Initially, um, he had to go to extensive speech therapy, occupational and physical therapy. Um, he had some cognitive treatment, um, motor sensory stimulation, case management, psychotherapy, psychiatric care. He was always seeing a neurologist um, and we had plenty of primary care appointments. At one point he had um, lost his tunnel vision on his left side, um, on his peripheral vision loss, which um, ended up coming back. But he suffered a lot with PTSD, anxiety, depression, nightmares, and, and uh, flashbacks and night sweats. You know, I experienced it all with him. So I, of course, I know the things that he had gone through after the shooting and um, just seeing him suffer in that way. But the things that he did to make himself feel better was actually recording music and that was one of the things that he loved doing and um, that was a, uh, where he was able to release and get a lot of his things out but he still had this you know yearning of missing his best friend and um, because he was in ICU at the time he wasn't even able to attend his funeral so he had missed out on so much and lost so much in a, just like he one song he has is called in a blink of an eye my whole life changed and you know he still continued in that depression and uh, trust me uh, it wasn't his first time that he tried to um, suicide but we still had help from and we kept you know the information around to prevent and you know we became more mindful of it but sometimes if you just you know a person is not going to tell you everything that you're going through and and that's where my um bargaining came in because i thought that I, there was so much more that i could have done um after he moved here and moved back to um pensacola where the initial shot shooting was i was just so fearful for a long time myself um not being able to see him day to day but I bargained with that for so long. Uh, I wished I could have did. I wished I could have did. Who was a person um, in your life that you felt that bargaining with? Uh, Leroy. Uh, this was my oldest kid's father, mm -hmm. Brenda and Deborah. We had divorce, and after he died, I felt bad because that was my kid's father, and I didn't know you know, really how to act because at one time we was in love and we had a home and family. Mm -hmm. But at, at this particular time, I we was divorced. Yeah. So, and I felt guilty and 
you know, then I start thinking that maybe if I'd have hung in there a little longer, mm -hmm. we could have been together and he wouldn't have been in that place at the, at this time and he will still be with us because of our kids. Now they are uh, without their father, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I felt guilty about that. But he also came to me after he saw me struggling because mm -hmm. I was torn, yeah. you know, trying to find out how to act with my kids around when they talk about their father and if I didn't show any emotion mm -hmm. that would make them sad you know because I didn't want them to feel that mama didn't care about their dad okay and but he saw me struggling with that and he came to me one one morning for a day mm -hmm. I felt the bed I was laying down in the bed and he, the bed went down when you tell when someone sit on the bed mm -hmm. the mattress and he said shotgun, that was my nickname. Shotgun. Yes, and he said shotgun. He said, don't uh, feel bad. He said, stop making yourself suffer. He said, I'm sorry for the things that I did to you. I put my pos myself in that position for you to divorce me. Oh. He said, and please forgive me for everything that I did to you. And that gave me relief mm -hmm. and made me feel better so that I can accept of his loss more because I didn't have that anger that I've been had been having for him but time prior to pretend that I was okay mm -hmm. but that gave me a big release when he uh, apologized to me oh my after I after he moved here yeah and I wrote about it and I think that did a lot to help me to identify with the shooting yeah I felt better about that yeah because I wrote things down from my heart. Mm -hmm. It was like on Christmas Eve, you know, you look at this star, this is when Jesus was born. That's the symbol we go by, you know, Christmas Eve. Uh, then Jesus was born Christmas morning. And I will always look up in the sky and ask for a miracle. Mm -hmm. And that's what I had done. And that's what I believe that God had given me when Taki was shot, he got shot in December, and mm -hmm. that was a miracle that he had restored he back to yeah. us. Yes, absolutely, to absolutely. And then I had seen him in the pulpit. Mm -hmm. I was in church, but he was the one in the pulpit, and mm -hmm. he raised his hand up, saying, "Big Mama, I made it." Mm -hmm. And maybe that's some of the reason I haven't gotten to where I need to go because. And I know I have to just really talk to God about that because I said, well, you showed me yeah. him in the pulpit. Mm -hmm. What did that mean? Mm -hmm. Because I was, I assumed that, that he was going to maybe come up this great preacher one year. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's what he's doing, mm -hmm. where he's at. Right. Because he's had a story to tell. Mm -hmm. And he was helping a lot of the young men after he got shot. Mm -hmm. And he was still doing that. Mm -hmm. I, call I, him just, the, I call him the disciple of Christ because yeah, he and, definitely and, was in the street I, I, I telling understand. us, telling others about, you know, his his old experience doing yeah. the shooting and, you know, what transpired and, you know, coming back from the effects of the shooting and the trial and all that that he was, you know, dealing with and harboring. Um, I look back now and. His story is just a ministry itself of, you know, what all he went through and how he was able to come out of that. And for him to still love the Lord, you know, it's just, you know, with all that that he had went through, you know, the, the shooting for himself, having a bullet in his brain, for him losing his best friend from now you got to go through a child, um, a trial. And I always refer back to um, the 23rd Psalms and when it says that, God will prepare a table before your enemies and that's exactly what he experienced. He was yes, able he to sure look did. them in the face and, and point out who had did these things to him and his friend and um, I just I was stuck with how could he live past the um, the shooting and yet his life ended in the way that it did. I was stuck there um, but I what I ended up learning was I have been grieving for five years you know already um, because of the shooting and 
always trying to make sure that he was okay. But now when I look at it, I see that, you know, his purpose was fulfilled. He was left behind to do what he needed to do to help. There were other families that also, you know, um, that lost someone. Um, I remember writing a letter to the judge stating that, you know, four families was affected because it was two gentlemen that were on trial for the murder and the attempted murder and not only their that family the family that lost their son and then us so it was a lot it, we went through a lot within this five years and even when we have to see the appeals come up because they try to appeal you know that anxiousness comes back and i can only imagine with my son having to constantly go through that um, it seemed like it was never ending of that night um, when all things happened, when those things happened to him. But at some point, um, I just stopped saying that I'm no longer going to be in this place. And that's what happened for me for the acceptance. So now we're at acceptance. Um, what relationship in your life were you able to accept that person's dying? My mom's death. Mm -hmm. When uh, she passed. For some reason, I, I well, I dreamt about her dying, not dying, as she said, wait till sister get come. And mm -hmm. I thought that, you know. She was going to wait until you got there to pass She was going to wait until I got uh -huh. there because mm -hmm. my mama named Mary. Mm -hmm. And I was named after her. Mm -hmm. So I just felt that we had that connection. But I knew she, um, the doctors had given her six months, but I knew with her condition, after I found out the, what she was sick with, I knew she wouldn't last for six months. Mm -hmm. And I had reconciled to myself that she she was going to leave, and I didn't want to see her in pain right. anymore because she had gotten very frail, mm -hmm. and her memory was leaving her, and mm -hmm. she was not the Mary Clark. That you knew. Y yes. Right. And I knew she was a godly woman, so... Mm -hmm. She didn't have to get ready. She was already at the door, mm -hmm. and all she needed to do was just step right on in. Mm -hmm. So that was that. I was happy for that transition because I knew she was she right. was a Christian, so yeah. I didn't have to worry about that. And she had been here 94 long years. Mm -hmm. And I, and a part of acceptance it, it says here, um, according to grief.com. Instead of denying our feelings, we listen to our own needs. We move, we change, we grow, and we evolve. And when we're in that state, we're able to accept the fact that a person has transitioned. And I do think that expected death is more easier than traumatic yes. death. Yes. I, I did go through problems because that was my mother and I loved right. her. Mm -hmm. She died at uh, October the 5th, 2002. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my birthday was in November. Okay. And coming up to my birthday, oh, I just was having a fit, you know. Yeah. I just couldn't cope with me having a birthday. And my mom was not here to call me and say, happy birthday, sister. Right, because that never existed that, before. No, exactly. You know, <laughs> uh -huh. how will I make it through this birthday? Mm -hmm. And my mom don't yes. call me or send me a card mm -hmm. saying, happy birthday, sister. They all call me sister because my name is Mary mm -hmm. and my mom named Mary. So I sat there and I sat there and I was just going through this and I was sitting there and tears began to fall. And all of a sudden I heard this voice and I know it was the Lord. He said, go get your Christmas stuff and just go start putting your Christmas stuff out. Mm -hmm. I said, Je December? November? I'm sorry. November? Mm -hmm. So I said, okay. So I got up just like an obedient kid, mm -hmm. went in the utility room, mm -hmm. got the box down off the shelf. Time I got the box down, mm -hmm. I card fell out the box okay the only thing fell out this box mm -hmm. so i picked the card up off the floor it was a birthday card wow so i said well why is a birthday card in here with the christmas decoration <laughs> right so i opened the card mm -hmm. immediately i recognized the handwriting it was grandma. It was from my mother. Oh, Happy my birthday, God. sister. Oh, wow. See? Oh, so wow. So you didn't miss anything I at didn't, all. <laughs> I didn't miss anything. Oh, that is such I a good story. Yes. 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 I am so... That is... 
that's heartfelt because I know I felt the same way too, Mom. Um, I just didn't understand how I was going to move forward either, you yes. know, on the birthday, not being able to hear his voice. So yeah. I, I can, I definitely can relate. Wow, you've had some great encounters with spirit throughout your journey of, of grief. And let's go into a little bit about your patient care experience because there's over 40 different types of grief. And according to um, the grief recovery method, their um, statement is grief is the conflicting feeling caused by the end of our change in a familiar pattern or behavior. And that's also losses can also consider to be considered as um, being our end of school, business readjustment, a foreclosure on your home, divorce, um, your child leaving home, or childhood traumas that happen to you, chronic pain. And I just wanted to go over those things because a lot of times when we talk about grief, people often think that it's death. It doesn't have to be a physical, it could be some type of emotional. Um, feeling that you've had because of loss on a job or you didn't get a promotion or just like I said earlier it could be a divorce or but because you went into patient care and that's dealing with um, people's health and the loss of you not being able to function anymore can you talk a little bit about the grief world in that aspect of you um, working as a patient care and how did that come about? Oh yes, I uh, got this job at a nursing home and they was offering a CNA degree if you work for them a year after you get the CNA degree. Mm -hmm. And I decided to go for it because I felt like something in my heart mm -hmm. that I will, uh, I, I, I have to do this because I felt it in my heart. So. Mm -hmm. I taken the job, and one day I was walking down the hall mm -hmm. at the nursing home, and I saw a gathering at this door, and I heard somebody screaming in the room. So mm. I stepped up and I said, "Well, what's happening?" And so one of the nurses told me, "Well, she's transitioning." Okay. And they were just standing there, okay. about two nurses and two or three uh, CNAs. Family? Okay. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and, and it just didn't seem right. And and for some reason, I parted them and walked in the room, walked in the room, and the lady was in the bed, and she was just screaming, and because she was afraid, she was alone, and mm -hmm. she didn't have family around her. I pulled my shoes off. I got crossed over the rail, because the rails was up on the bed. Mm -hmm. I crossed over and got that woman, put her in my arms and rocked her. Oh, wow. I rocked her and gently just caressed her and just told her everything will be all right. She's not alone. And cross over, don't be afraid. And that came natural you, to it you was, just it, to do? It was something like if I had done this many a times before. And wow. this was my first experience. Wow. With anyone. And I just kept rocking her. I said, just just relax. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid. I said, I'm here. I'm here. And I would just, you know, rub her gently. And I said, just cross over, honey. You'll be all right. And all she right. took her last she breath. She took her last breath in my arms. Oh, wow. I had got in the bed with her. So, okay. Wow, that's just amazing within itself just to even think about that. That's something that you would want to do. I mean, I guess just because, like you said, spirit led you yes. to do a lot of things. But a lot of people aren't capable of this. I know. That's why they were standing at the door. <laughs> right, looking, looking at you, looking, looking around looking uh -huh, and not doing anything. Door. I mean, they were just standing there looking at this lady. Just Wow. She was so afraid of just being alone. Yeah. And then she knew that what was on the other side for her, she saw that mm -hmm. and she was afraid to just relax and go on cross. Mm -hmm. And I was glad that I was able to help her to go gently. And I'm glad that we're talking about that because my mother, of course, she still, you know, struggles with the fact that, you know, my son has transitioned and I was telling her the other day, mom, you have to really understand who you are and you're cap and that you are so capable of being able to do the same thing um if you've had these patients that you can just 
you know, come in and, and take care of and, and make sure that they transition properly, you, she could be able to do the same thing. But like she knows, it's going to be in her timing. But yes. I just want her to realize the strength that she has to help others. She has that same capability, you know, for herself. Exactly. And sometimes, just like we help someone, someone mm -hmm. also has is to out help. there to help me. Absolutely. And it goes both ways. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not too strong that I can just automatically do it, myself, do it right. myself. Yeah. I know I will get there. Yeah. But it may take a couple of days, yeah. you know, it's, However long However, it takes, as long yeah. As I get there, yeah. You know? But I just, I be, be me being your daughter. I just want to remind you of your strength yes. and that that you're capable yes. of it. And not that I'm rushing you because it's gonna take you to be. You know, you. It starts with you, and you have to be the one to say, okay enough is enough i'm exactly. ready to move forward in your time and what feels comfortable to you and but i just want you to know that you're strong because right now i can go out there right now and do the same thing for that somebody I did else. for someone mm -hmm. else but i need it for myself uh, as well ooh, absolutely we do that all the time yes. I, uh, yeah that's preaching to the choir right there because <laughs> i often have all this great advice for my girlfriends mm -hmm. and then i'm the one sitting to the side exactly. later on dealing with the same you know emotional stressors um, but how about another time? Um, you know, I know you told me before that you've actually, your brother told you that you worked yourself out of jobs. Yes, and I did. And that was kind of funny, but I did work myself out of a job. A friend of mine had told me about a job. They needed a housekeeper mm -hmm. and they was paying very well. So I accepted it and went and applied for the job and got the job. Mm -hmm. And I think I had been there for maybe about six or seven months. And this uh, lady, she had a daughter that was bed bound. Mm -hmm. She had been in a motorcycle accident. Mm -hmm. And the doctors told her, the mother, that her daughter will always be a vegetable. Mm -hmm. but they had a therapy that came in like three times a work mm -hmm. week mm -hmm. and to do exercise on her. But they got nowhere for about six or seven months. Mm -hmm. Kathy was her name. And Kathy did no improvement. Mm -hmm. So. The mother was disgusted because her daughter was not getting better. Mm -hmm. So she explained to me one day, she said, well, Mary, she said, I'm going to have to find me another therapist, therapist mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. come and help Kathy, she said, because this is not working out. And she <laughs> was not going to accept her being in being a, a vegetable. Right. And I don't know, uh, just a bell just went off in me. I said, Miss Kennedy, I said, um, let me try it. I had no knowledge of doing no kind of therapy. <laughs> but you were willing is I the thing. I was willing, Amen. yes. And then I guess back in my head, I remember what Reverend William told me. He said, you have something in you that God is going to use. Mm -hmm. You are unique. And that came out. Wow. Because it must have been for real, true. Mm -hmm. She gave me the chance. Oh, this wow. lady looked me dead in my eyes. She said, Mary, she said, you know, I said, no, I don't. Do you know anything about therapy? I said, no. She said, but you know what? She said, I'm going to trust you. Oh, wow. And she did. Kathy was bed bound. Yes, yes. When I left, she was what walking. Okay, so she I, what what stages did she go through? She went from the bed to a wheelchair. Uh-huh. From the wheelchair to a walker. Come on now. From the walker to a cane. All right now. From the cane, she was on her own. Okay, and then she started riding bikes again or something yes, like that? Yes, she did. <laughs> and that's when my brother told me, say, you just work yourself out of the job. Uh, something else that also occurred during that, t during that transition um, for my mother as she was, you know, working herself out of a job which she didn't know but um that part of my life with me being able to go because a lot of time the kennedys they would travel and they lived on the beach and and they um not actually on the beach they lived in gulf breeze near the beach but they had this amazing beautiful pool this big old pretty house they had so many refrigerators okay you know we were middle class so but us me going to a home like this um, as a little kid, I was able to see so much more. I remember seeing the double toilet for the first time, you know, being there in this huge closet and there was a his and a her closet. So that's initially where outside of my mom being the amazing decorator, interior designer, um, because I get a lot of that from her. But my first experience of seeing a, you know, a really elegant home, you know, 
because I had never been in one of those before, but um, just being able to have that experience to be able to stay the night and live in the house and and um, see the different textures of the wallpaper so cool. and like yeah, because she would let us come and stay and I was just so excited. So for me as a child being able to see that, it taught me that there was so much more outside of the four corners that I was living in um, back in our little community, um, but there was so much more. And that's when, you know, I guess my design the designer and decor process in me grew because I knew that there was so much more. Um, the textures of the tub, the towel on the floor. Um, but even though my mother that was there for some reason, I got something out of it as well as a young child. And I know I had to be about maybe what, eight or nine or something like that. Yes. But wow, we both had an experience during that time. And how about you working in the grief world and being a part of hospice. I mean, that just kind of lined up for you as yes, well. Yes, because after I worked myself out of a job, <laughs> <Right. laughs> I had to find a job. Right. So I was just, I was riding down the street one day. God mm -hmm. is so faithful. Yes. I looked to my left and there was a sign in the window, help wanted, mm -hmm. health care, mm -hmm. hospice. I didn't know anything about hospice. I was just wanted me a job. Right. So I went in and applied, so the lady actually said, do you know what hospice means? I said, no, but if it's healthcare, I was all right with that. Yeah. Because I wanted to get away from the nursing home because I didn't like the way they treated the per patients mm -hmm. by getting them up so early in the morning. Yeah. And, and I it kept going back to the time I had to, I, was with the lady that did the transition and mm -hmm. all they did was just stand and watch her. Yeah. I, that, I kept going back to that. But I you wanted, wanted a more personal yeah, something. Um, relationship and with the person. they explained it to me and I took some classes. Uh -huh. Oh, that was home. You loved it. Yes. Yeah, and it takes a special type of person oh, to work for hospice. Yes. Everybody can't do that. I love working for hospice. Wow. It's just like my heart just pours out to them mm -hmm. because I want them to have dignity and this is what it's about mm -hmm. for the patient to have dignity even though they are passing over mm -hmm. you know and, and it's it, not to help them no, get better right it's to show you know I still have dignity mm -hmm. even though I'm leaving you don't have to be just thrown to the side because your time is up yeah you don't have to be look like anything you still want to look nice so mm -hmm. still be yourself even mm -hmm. though you can't mm -hmm. and you used to clean the people after they clean them up or yes. prepare them for, for um yes. and for, for uh the, the doctor to even come in to okay. pronounce okay mm -hmm. i will get them when, the, when when they die i will get them all beautiful oh that's the a one to come in to take them out oh, wow. and pronounce them dead. Well, that definitely is uh, they have, being unique because yes. I don't know if that's something that I could handle. They have called me, the family members called me, the nurse, the, the uh, deaf angel. Uh -huh. but and that's real popular now. It was so rewarding because they loved me too. Mm -hmm. Those patients would tell me their darkest secrets. But I had to keep it to myself. Wow! And they needed someone that to they can release oh, that too before, right. yeah, before they passed on. I can understand that. Someone that they could trust. Wow! To tell those things to. Wow! And you know that death angel is really kind of getting popular now because I've heard so many times now, like uh, a death medulla and um, death midwife. A lot of people are taking, you know, interest in that now. Um, which that's always been um, hospice uh, yeah. way of helping people transition over. And um, like you said, you felt at home. A lot of people, I that's did. not, I don't think no, that's a job not, that anybody could not just do. because a lot of nurses with degrees, RNs, mm -hmm. LPNs have came and worked for hospice. But they came to get the patient well. Mm -hmm. And when they found out that hospice was not about that, wow, they will quit. They didn't have it in their heart to not to, to withdraw or to try to keep that person healthy. Yeah. Because when they went to school, they was not trained that. Mm -hmm. They were they went to school to keep the person alive. Mm -hmm. But you have to have a, there's another side to that. Yeah. You have to be willing to accept this when you get to a certain level in life and it's time for you to transition. Mm -hmm. That person wants to have dignity just as much as you do and you living. Yeah. 
Hello, so don't nice. just shift me out just because I'm on my way out. Mm -hmm. Let me look beautiful. Or let me be, you know, smell good. Mm -hmm. and treat me kind. Yes. Just don't. Yeah, but I guess maybe the family members, they don't know. It's hard already for them to accept the death, but it's it, it has it has to be God ordained to send people in like you because and that's at the what time. They told. That's, and you know, and when they when they really get it, mm -hmm. they'd be so grateful. Oh yeah. Because they would have never gotten there by themselves. Yeah. You know, because that's their loved one. And, and how was your relationship that? with, with oh. the families? Beautiful. I became part of their family. Yeah. Yes. Wow. I, it was just. It Were was there? So do, okay. Because I, I real I remember. Because honey, my mom used to have me doing her paperwork, helping her with her paper. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So I've also been a part of the grief world for a long with time her, it, it with her. British and India. I know they, they told me they used to go, go to work me. with you. Yes. Oh yeah, she used to send my yes. children to, to work with the Lord. And I would go to their funerals, and that would be yeah. just like a. Yeah. Our family members. But it could be a little crazy too, huh? Yeah. Yeah. It, sometimes. Yeah, because families are crazy during death, right? Of course. They are. <laughs> yeah. You know, they, they yeah, they're going them, through. You know, yeah, they're, they're going through at the time. I've seen some crazy stuff you would never believe. I'm a, yeah, I know you. So, you told me a couple of things, but I. Uh, but it's just I think us having this conversation letting people know you know about the stages of grief the denial the anger the bargaining the depression it's, and it's the acceptance not. it's all a part of yes, you going through this transition and learning how to deal with death and i also like i wanted to of course hit on my mother being a part of the grief world and i don't know if it's just like a full circle even for myself being a part of it as a young you know young age i i also too was a, a cna um, trying to go and, and become a nurse practitioner, which I, I never ended up getting there. But um, I just, I love taking care of people. I, you know, I, that has to be a big part of it, having no, you know, the need and want to always take care of people. And um, I just thank God for you because it needs to be more. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there. A shout out to hospice and yes. and thank and thank God that we do that. God has made a you know created a a, a space for I you know. Here. Mm -hmm. at work here at Peachtree Hospice. Yes, you did. You sure yes, did. did. You sure did. So that's just in her blood to do and to take care of people. I'm just so happy to be having this conversation, like I said, about uh, people transitioning and um, expected death and, and traumatic deaths. Uh, it's something that and I'm not saying everybody will experience in a lifetime, but you can make it through. And a part of my process of becoming a grief coach is based on, of course, it's life coaching which is the skill to guide people and have them identify and achieve personal goals but this is to also to have them to accomplish um, certain things that they are inquiring about what they want to do for themselves and i'm just here to to ask the client you know to ask the client questions and to figure out how can i support you as a coach and what do you need to work on to move past those those particular stages of grief where you're stuck and that's why I have my mother here today to talk about this but I know our show is talking about uniqueness and really her uniqueness is learning the clairvoyant see that she has and tr and how over the years that spirit has come to her and talked to her and and how she's learned to develop that and be okay with dealing with death and being around death and being in the grief world but our show is talking about uniqueness is which that is something that she definitely is but let's talk about how did i end up with the name miami how unique is that oh i <laughs> knew that was gonna be that question <laughs> and we were living in miami mm -hmm. her father was from detroit michigan but he fell in love with miami on his first visit mm -hmm. so we moved from little vero beach my hometown and we moved to uh, Miami and when we got pregnant well most of the times we'll say if it's a boy the, the woman would like to name the boy after this the father uh -huh. so he asked me would it be okay if, if it's a girl could he name her uh -huh. I told him yes and I had no idea that he was talking about naming my child Miami Okay. My child. Uh-huh. Your child. <laughs> so what occurred? So, oh, really? Okay. Well, 
when we were sure that everything was all right with the baby, mm-hmm. you know, he stopped planning what he wanted to name the baby. Mm-hmm. So he decided to give me a hint. Uh-oh. So I said, well, okay. He said, I'll tell you what it is. I'll give you a hint. He said, it's have two M's mm-hmm. and two I's in the name. All right now. And you see it every day. Uh-huh. Boy, I got suspicious. <laughs> I'm a fine out. Ah, Lord. Come on now. I could see it every day. That was what he told me. Mm-hmm. So, okay. I would go outside. Mm-mm. And I'm looking all around in the neighborhood. All up in the sky. Uh-uh. What do I see with two M's and two I's? And you couldn't put it together? Never. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So... That went on and went on and the craziest things that happened when I got in labor. The man drove on the wrong side of the street. Oh, Lord. On the sidewalk, Typical passing man. cars. Uh-huh. And had my daughter breach. Mm-hmm. Breach, baby. I came feet first, you know, stepping she in the sun. She had to step into Miami. Oh, yes, please believe it. So... He had went back home to check after the delivery. He went back home to check on Deborah and Brenda to make sure they was getting ready for school because it was a Monday morning. Miami was born. Mm-hmm. Monday, well, 12.35. But, hey. but he had left and went to uh, make sure that they got ready for school that morning. Mm-hmm. So by the time he got back, they had brought their papers around for me to name the baby. I said, well, my husband's going to name her. So he, You still at this point don't have a clue? Don't have a clue. Oh, gosh. So when he got back in the room, he's, I told him, I said, the form's over there for you to fill out and name of the baby. So he said, oh, he was so excited. He was sitting in the chair, crossed his little leg, uh-huh. and everything, and he started writing. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> and he gave, put the, uh, the paper back on the table that, which he, the tray that, you know, covers the table. Uh-huh. I'm sorry. I'm so excited right now telling this story. So I look down on this paper. <laughs> now, first thing I say, you still gonna use the middle name Nicole? Mm-hmm. I said yes. Okay. So, but honey, I look down on this paper because I wanted to find out what the first name was. I wasn't thinking about the middle name. Right, right, right. I look down and when I saw Miami, I start screaming. <laughs> Why? I start. Who would name that baby Miami? <laughs> That's the first thing. That's you unique, y'all. <laughs> okay. So the nurse came running down to the room. Uh-uh. Miss Douglas, Miss Douglas, Miss Douglas, what's wrong? I said, this man just named my baby Miami. <laughs> Jackson Memorial Hospital. Oh my God. So she took a breath and she, then she smiled. She said, oh, that's nice. She <laughs> said, nobody never did that. No wonder. <laughs> right. So, oh. Goodness, I say he done named my baby Miami. And then she told me, she said, when you get home, mm-hmm. look up in this um, net book mm-hmm. and find out That's what the finished. meaning of Miami. Okay. So sure enough, when I got home, I looked it up. Mm-hmm. It means running water. Uh-huh. The Indian discovered Miami. Yeah. And that was the Indian's name. My, Run, my his name Miami. Miami, but he was his name was Running Water, but Running Water meant Miami. Well, there that's you go, the folks. That's why that's her the name. story. That's how she got her name. That's why I'm unique. That's why she's unique. Yes. And thank you guys for tuning in. We will be at, back with you next week with another topic on grief talk. Thank y'all for tuning in. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs> Well, there you have it, Grief Nation listeners, and thank you for tuning in to another transformative segment of It's the Miami Night Show, Grief Talk. Today, we give thanks, filled with love and gratitude, for our special guest, Mary Murphy, for expressing your very unique grief journey and sharing ways of understanding the healing process. This is your girl, Miami Knight, with much love and light until we connect again spiritually.